Hey guys, what's going on? Paul here. Welcome back to another Cardano video. And this one isn't really going to be focusing on me interviewing anyone. I have been sent over a recording of a panel discussion that happened last week in Hong Kong. Thought it was very interesting. It was White Cardano and it featured Waffle Capital, Sidon Labs and Minswap Labs talking about why build on Cardano from their own perspective? So coming from the perspective of a VC and from the perspective of a protocol and others looking to build too. So it's interesting to hear the different perspectives, what they saw in Cardano, why they are still here, even though there's lots of different things going on, lots of chains they could build on and looking at Cardano DeFi in other interesting aspects. Hopefully you'll be able to pick something up from it. Do share it out to let others know kind of what's going on with this or looking at it from different angles or different points of view as well. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you're looking for more Cardano content. Give the video a like and ask questions down below. The panel speakers, hopefully I'll be able to have them on here for an interview or a live stream fairly soon too. And we could look at some of the follow-up questions for that. So let's hand it over to them. Uh, the flow of the evening is to first ask the panelists some questions about core topics surrounding the Cardano ecosystem. Then we'll open up the floor to the audience for some questions. And finally, we'll shift into a more casual networking and drinks. So to begin, uh, if you guys could each introduce yourselves, please, beginning with Yuri. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Yuri Browner. I'm the CEO of Waffle Capital. I've been in crypto since 2017. And like everyone, I started with Bitcoin and then went down the Ethereum route. And then eventually I, I landed on Cardano. I was yeah, also in 2017. And uh, in 2022, we founded Waffle Capital. What we do is we, uh, we provide liquidity and we, we do yield farming, what we call it, generate yield inside the Cardano ecosystem. So we use the centralized finance to generate yield for our investors. All right, thank you, Yuri. Um, so nice to see all of you tonight here. Um, so I'm Kinsen, the co-founder of Sidan Lab. So what we are doing right now is contributing to open source collaboration, doing open source project right now. And also we are together hosting, uh, together with Waffle Capital to host Hong Kong Cardano community. And in August, we will host a developer series to onboard, uh, to onboard builders as well. So our objective in, is to onboard users and builders in Hong Kong and across Asia. Yeah, uh, my name is Adrian. First of all, thanks so much for having me here. Actually, it's the first time today that I'm showing my face. Usually, I I go online by the name Purito General. Uh, and I've been working for Minswap Labs for almost two years now. I got into crypto in 2021. So I was first a volunteer for the project for a year. And then eventually, I joined the team. I do the growth part. So I do partnerships, tokenomics, DeFi. That's kind of my jam. Uh, in Minswap, we are the largest decentralized exchange on Cardano. We have the largest TDL. And for those who aren't aware, a decentralized exchange is the same like Uniswap or Ethereum. It's an exchange where you can trade tokens, in this case, Cardano tokens. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, and thank you all again for making it out today. Uh, let's kick off the discussions. So, um, Kingston, while you have the mic, what is it about Cardano that attracted you to the space versus other blockchains? Uh, that's a really good question that a lot of people ask me all the time. So as you know, there are a lot of different blockchains that are on um, in the ecosystem. So the reason why I'm attracted to Cardano is because of the security. So you heard a lot of, a lot of news saying that, oh, there's a lot of funds, um, there's a lot of hacks. However, in Cardano, there's not, no such thing. And on the Cardano ecosystem, there's no single point of failure as well because it is quite decentralized and also is again very secure. So that's why um, I'm strongly attracted to it and start to study with it and then uh, try to onboard the user and the builder side in Hong Kong. If uh, Adrian could go next. Actually, can you repeat the question? <laughs> yes. Uh, what is it about Cardano that attracted you to the space versus other blockchains? Okay, so when I was first getting into crypto in 2021, there was lots of uh, attention around Cardano. Uh, we were just releasing smart contracts. At the time, some people critical of Cardano were saying, no, smart, smart contracts will never be a thing. It will never happen. I thought, like, of course it will happen, and that could be a great opportunity to me to get involved, so I started volunteering for projects, doing proofreading, translating, 
and eventually I landed a job at Minstrop Labs. Uh, so, and then when it comes to DeFi, because that's what I'm mostly passionate about, DeFi, Cardano has something that is called liquid staking. I think we'll discuss more about it today, but uh, how that enables DeFi on Cardano is super special, so let's talk about it more later. Yes, and uh, now over to Yuri, a little bit more about your background and what is it that attracted you to Cardano? Okay, so uh, about the background, yeah, when I started in 2017, uh, there was Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a whole bunch of other cryptocurrencies already. And back then, the main conversation focused around scalability. Everyone was looking to, to find a blockchain that could actually scale. Um, they were getting too congested. So in my research, um, while I was trying to do the same thing, research what is the next big blockchain, I stumbled upon um, Charles Hoskinson's video. He's the founder of Cardano. And I really encourage anyone to, to watch this video because he basically lays down the plan on a whiteboard. And so I was really compelled by the use of the scientific method. I thought finally we had the adults in the room because if you think about value living on a blockchain, the first thing you have to think about is, is really security. Um, uh, and then, so the, the scientific approach basically just just gave a strong foundation in, in, in this blockchain. Um, it's not just a bunch of kids saying, oh, trust us, you know, this is gonna work. Uh, for, for the first time, there was actually professors and actual academic papers that you could read, and uh, professors giving lectures about some of the technology they were developing. So I was really compelled by this. Um, and then, of course, the vision overall. I can talk about the treasury, we can talk about decentralization, we can talk about liquid staking. But overall, I have a lot of things to say. That's why I live in this ecosystem. But those are the main things. Afterwards, nowadays, I think I'm mostly excited about governance, which we'll also talk about. Yeah, super right. We'll definitely touch on all of those things. Uh, while you mentioned liquid staking and while you have the mic, some people may or may not know that Cardano is a proof of stake blockchain. And uh, proof of stake can mean different things for different protocols. Uh, so for Yuri, while you have the mic, what is proof of stake on Cardano? All right. You guys all right there? Yeah, we're trying to move everyone. All right, please fight. don't be shy, you guys. Come closer, you know, if there's seas, just, we won't eat you. Um, so quickly to talk about Cardano's proof of stake, I have to talk about proof of work. Does anyone know, uh, how, many pe how many people are familiar with proof of work? Just show of hands, are you familiar? Right, okay, so but just quickly, a blockchain is a replicated ledger. It's a distributed replicated ledger, which means it's a basically a book where you have all the transactions written, and that's replicated. We have copies of it, so that if one copy burns, we all have the other copies. Um, the, the, then the question becomes, which one of the actors who has one of the copies gets to write the next transactions? Because you can't always be the same person, otherwise it's like essentially a bank, it's centralized. So every time it has to be a different actor processing transaction. And that process of choosing is what we call the consensus mechanism. Bitcoin has a consensus mechanism called proof of work. Uh, to make things really simple, you have to solve a calculation, I call it the Rubik's Cube, and you have to be the fastest at solving it. If you solve it, you get to write the next transactions, and the other ones will copy from you and you get paid. Uh, this process is really energy consuming, because basically uh, it's, a, it's a race, and it's a race where you have to solve the problem, brute force. So what is consuming all that electricity on Bitcoin is basically uh, the act is trying to solve the problem, right? Try to solve the Rubik's Cube as fast as possible. On Cardano, things work a little bit differently. We have something like that looks more like a, like a casino roulette, I like to call it, where who gets to choose the next transaction is basically kind of you throw the ball and, and there's all these holes and it'll fall into one of those holes and then, and then that actor that gets chosen will write the transactions. Um, so in Cardano, to be, in order to be one of those holes, you have to set up a validator node, but you also need something called delegation. And delegation is basically essentially people uh, voting for you with their ADA, with their token ADA, and you represent their stake on the blockchain. And so the more people delegate their ADA to this particular stake pool, the larger the hole becomes and the more likely you are to be chosen to write down the transactions. That's how a Cardano works. The great thing about this though, is that when people delegate, in other words, they're staking, um, they don't have to, to lose custody of their coins and they don't have to lock it also. So you choose who is going to represent you on the blockchain and then sort of the wheel continues 
And there's also one last thing I'll mention is that a, a validator, a stable operator, cannot become infinitely large. Because if someone becomes really popular and everyone delegates to them, well, we have, again, just one actor doing all the things. So there's a limit to how big a stable can become. Some people can create multiple stables, but that also becomes costly. So I try to keep this short, but in a nutshell, that's how it works. Yes, thank you for explaining the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. So proof of work on Bitcoin is where you solve this Rubik's Cube using energy and you get to decide how transactions go through. And proof of stake has a different mechanism. But uh, Adrian, to build on proof of stake on Cardano and what liquid staking on Cardano means. Sure, yeah, thanks so much for the explanation. And I just wanna make a point again, maybe we're getting a bit technical, but uh, seriously, maybe I'm a bit biased, but the proof of stake that Cardano in particular implemented is called Ouroboros, um, the consensus mechanism. I really think it's the best in the industry right now. Um, there's also the consensus in the industry now when new chains are launching that proof of stake is the best way. You see all of the new layer ones, they're all proof of stake. But between those, I think the way Cardano introduced it uh, is definitely the best. Um, why? So we have what is called liquid staking. The stake is liquid. You don't have to lock up funds. You can have access to them anytime. It's also non-custodial. So for a DEX, for our case, when you have people who provide liquidity in a liquidity pool, if they provide ADA, this ADA can be staked right directly and you can direct the yield to the liquidity providers directly. In other chains, for example, you need like an additional protocol, an additional layer of risk to do that whole process. So on Cardano, given the liquid liquid staking nature, you don't need an extra protocol to provide the staking yield to what the liquidity providers uh, that are on a DEX. So for those of you who are from traditional finance, Let's say that you have a big stack of gold and you want to unlock some purchasing power. So you could technically lock that gold up and borrow against it while that gold is still earning you yield. That's only possible on Cardano because of how liquid staking is built. So no matter where your money is being used in the financial ecosystem, you are still accessing this risk-free rate. Building on top of Cardano's advantages, there are a few things that I wanted to cover specifically. Firstly, Yuri, you spent a lot of time explaining Cardano to investors, right? Yes, I do. What are some of the most common misconceptions you come across and how do you address them? Okay, the, the, the first thing is not necessarily, a, the, the first thing to mention is not necessarily a misconception, but more just generally a lack of knowledge. People are just not aware of Cardano. They just know it exists out there and they generally know the price uh, but they don't know anything else about it. Uh, so the, once, the, the first problem is the, the, the lack of knowledge, and uh, which makes my job easier because once I start explaining it, people find it actually interesting enough. So that's a good sign. But uh, other, mis other real misconceptions have to do with um, the, the chain not being used. Um, and that's a bit strange because we have a lot of projects on it, uh, from AI to decentralized exchanges, lending, borrowing, oracles, real estate, uh, uh, decentralized cloud ser services. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things. We, we can't even keep up with it. So when people say, well, it's a bit of a ghost chain, nothing happens there, it's like, okay, but it, you know, if someone tells you that and you live in a really busy city, it's a bit strange. So, so that's one of the misconceptions. Another one has to do with Charles Hoskinson, the founder himself. Um, I don't know why people find him so controversial. He has his own YouTube channel and with 500 plus videos when only he speaks, and I've listened to every 500 plus of them, every single one of them. And so there's things I disagree with, there's things I agree with, but there's nothing actually that controversial there. And I think it has to do a lot with, you know, the way Twitter works and tribalism, and, and we can talk about how, you know, certain media have biases. But I just like to judge things on their merit. So when it comes to Charles, I disagree with some things, but actually, after listening to 500 plus video, it makes sense. Finally, um, that the, that we're not able to scale. That, you know, remember at the beginning I said we're looking for scalability. The thing, the thing that people are looking for is a metric called TPS, transaction per second. And it doesn't really fit into Cardano because Cardano, to my knowledge, is the only blockchain where you can, you can submit multiple transactions within a single transaction. So if you're, sending, you're trying to send 100 NFTs, and let's say you're trying to send 100 N NFTs not just to one wallet, but to 100 different wallets, you can do this 
in one transaction on Cardano, which is what most people are not aware of. You don't have to send a hundred transactions. So when you talk about scaling, one of the misconceptions, people always refer to this TPS, transaction per second, and in the case of Cardano, it's extremely misleading. Anyways, that's just a few. Yeah, it's nice that you took us through all of them, and uh, I definitely do understand that some of the metrics that exist are, are tailored towards measuring some particular blockchains. Um, while we're on the topic of uh, misconceptions, Kinson, another common one is that Cardano is difficult to build on. So from your perspective, why might people think that Cardano is difficult to build on, and what steps are being made to solve this? All right, thank you. So um, I think at the early stage, um, a lot of people have a lot of hesitance about the Hester development, uh, this language. So, but actually right now, there are a lot of different tools. For example, uh, in Jimba Labs, we have a live coding session every week to educate builders to learn how to build that on Cardano. And we have Mesh SDK as well, it's very simple to use. And the package size is about uh, 300 kilobytes only. So you can see the tools on the Cardano ecosystem are easier and wider for people to use right now. So anyone who wants to do a dev, you just need to find some time, do some research, and then you can start doing it already. And in Sita Lab, I think we are a platform that open to everyone to join, especially in our Discord channel. So if you haven't joined, feel free to join, of course. And then we also conduct different research based on the different proposition as well. Um, so we encourage people to collaborate um, in an open source manner. So that's why for the development side, I think it is easier right now for people to get on board into the Cardano ecosystem. So um, we first started off coding Cardano in a language called Haskell, which is a, a same high assurance code that's used for NASA and Google. But um, because of that high assurance code being difficult to write, Cardano has come up with several other different ways to bypass this. And uh, it's nice to see that the developer tooling has gotten so much better and has seen this dramatic growth. Um, that seems to be the trend for Cardano recently, and I'm sure Adrian here can attest. So Adrian, you're in the growth team of the biggest decentralized exchange on Cardano. In your experience, how have you seen Cardano progress since the last bull run in 2021? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. It's been a really wide ride uh, being a builder on Cardano. I remember in 2021, as I mentioned, people thought like, no, you, you will never have smart contracts and DEX will not be possible. There would be no DEX on Cardano and look where we are now. Um, actually, yeah, it's not been without some bumps on the road. Um, when the first decentralized exchange launched on Cardano, there was so much hype, uh, so many people wanting to, to use it that uh, we had quite some issues. It was called Sunday swap, and people would take days uh, for a swap to get processed. Um, yeah, that, that's not usually the case on blockchains. Eventually, MinSwap launched, and we think we, think we did some things better there. Um, we, we launched a way faster exchange, better usability. Uh, so I think things have way improved since then. And also, you know, when we started in 2021, we had zero TVL, basically. Maybe you can explain later what TVL means, but we had zero protocols, and right now we have a bunch of them. We have Indigo protocol, is the number one protocol right now on Cardano. They do synthetic assets, so you can use your ADA and you can mint different assets. You can mint, you can create US dollar, for example, or maybe in the future gold. Uh, you have also lending and borrowing protocols, one called Liquid is the biggest one. Uh, and we have also a family of protocols that is very unique to Cardano. Uh, one of them is called Fluid Tokens. I'm a big fan of it. And what it enables you, so using the special liquid staking we mentioned on Cardano, you can rent the staking keys. Uh, that's something you can only do on Cardano. No other blockchain really enables you for that. And you can do several use cases for that. One of these use cases is called um, ISPO or ISO. And basically it's a way for protocols to launch new tokens and you can stake your ADA there uh, in a non-custodial way. So very low risk and you can get the tokens in exchange. So yeah, it's been a wide ride since then. We have a lot of protocols and excited for, for more to come and more growth. I'm glad you brought up funding on Cardano. 
while you have the mic there, uh, tell us about the journey of MinSwap's inception and building on Cardano with no VCs. Yes, so, so MinSwap, basically how it started, it's an awesome story. It was basically a group of friends in Vietnam uh, who decided they want to build a decentralized exchange on Cardano. And at the time, as we mentioned, you had to code in this language called Haskell. That is a really difficult language. It's used like in, for NASA or type of very uh, specific for security measures and um, yeah, settings, for example. Uh, so they had to code in Haskell, and it was a very big challenge, especially because the other competitors, they had like millions of funding in, in VC funding. They were like American, maybe had worked in Google or companies like that. So they decided to still build it, and yeah, we came out on top. Uh, why we came out on top is because we had the community support. So instead of launching a token through raising funds from VCs, uh, what we did is strictly community-based. So the community is the only one owning the tokens. There's no private investors. There's no insiders. Um, and that way, we, we kind of rally the community behind us. And we kind of yeah got to be the number one, which we are now. Uh, it poses some challenges, too, being community-focused. For example, if you compare MinSwap to, to a DEX on other chain, like Uniswap, uh, they'll have way more funding, perhaps, so they can do different type of things. Uh, but we have on Cardano a very special community and the community support. And we have some community tools for funding too. Maybe we'll talk about it later, one of them called Project Catalyst. So yeah, it has some great advantages too. Yeah, well, we'll definitely be talking about Project Catalyst later. But to add some further context for those of you that uh, don't know Cardano, uh, most projects built on Cardano build from the ground up with little to no support from VCs. This has inspired a whole realm of community funding mechanisms, and MinSwap is one of the many examples where community funding has led to major success and a strong user base. Let's take a quick break now from the financial side and look at how Cardano incentivizes builders. Kinson, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of building on Cardano, and why did you choose to build on Cardano? Alright, thank you. So, as I mentioned before, building on uh, uh, Cardano is very secure in a way, like uh, there's no single point of failure, and also uh, there are no not bad hacks. I think for a lot of institution players, all the financial institutions, they don't want to lose their money, of course. And of course, there's a huge market in the, fi uh, in the high frequency trading world. So right now on Cardano, there's no high frequency trading, and from project hackers, which um, Adrian mentioned, we actually got a research proposal approved um, in the project catalyst. So basically we are doing a research on the possibility and the feasibility of high frequency trading. So um, with all these um, catalyst funding and also with all the um, toolings in the Mesh JS, as well, uh, Mesh SDK and also GitLabs as well, it's very convenient for um, institution players to Part, and also for the builders to onboard as well. So I think these um, advantages will help to continue to expand the Cardano ecosystem across the Asia side. Quickly, if I can add, Project Catalyst is essentially, for those who don't know, it's a fund that exists on Cardano and it's on the blockchain. And as I think it's about every three months or so, so every quarter, uh, there is some funding that is released for projects, so token holders get to vote on whether the money gets allocated or not. So it's like public funding, essentially. So far, I think it's been, uh, it's been, there's been, hundred over 170 projects, yeah, yeah. yeah something like that, and then there's something over, oh, I forget the number. How much was was uh, this, do you remember the number? How much? I forget. We'll have to double check that. But actually, it's in the tens and tens, if not the hundreds of millions, actually. So, Yuri, while you have the mic. Um, what are your two cents on the importance of DeFi on Cardano versus existing infrastructure in traditional finance? Okay, well, I hope it's no secret to anyone that that blockchain uh, appears to be a better form of, uh, of, of, of tech for, for financial instruments. Um, it's faster, uh, you also, it's transparent, so you can track who owns what at any time. The settlement time is also faster, so it makes it much more efficient. And where Cardano fits in that, and where it really helps improve is in the 
is in the robustness and the, the principles it has gone through. So the, the, what I talk about, the, the peer review, scientific research, the fact that it's been zero hacks, the fact that it's extremely decentralized, which means it's robust. Um, those are the things that, that are really are really there basically to, to, to take on that, that traditional finance and to bring it onto Cardano. We definitely agree that security is paramount when you're building financial infrastructure. Whenever building something, my founders and entrepreneurs in the room will know that it's all about priorities and navigating trade-offs. In line with this, Cardano took the research approach to find out what the priorities of a blockchain are and how to navigate trade-offs that come with security, scale, and decentralization. As it currently stands, Cardano's development is in its final stage of scale and governance. Thank you. Between the two, being scale and governance, at this moment, Cardano prioritizes governance. So, Yuri, why has Cardano prioritized governance? So, anyone heard of Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum Classic? So there's something called the fork. So what happens if, if you're in an ecosystem, say Bitcoin, and then there is a, there's a disagreement about the way forward, there's no real way to solve this. Generally, the miners have, have some of the powers. I, I heard some on Ethereum, some of the developers also have the powers, but there's no way to actually resolve this. So generally, there's a bit of anarchy and, and civil war inside an ecosystem. And then what ends up happening is a split in community, which is a huge loss of value. So governance is really important because it basically helps keep everyone together and it helps the community decide where the next step forward is. It's like saying, well, how important is governance in a corporation or just in a country? Right? So you need governance. Governance is really paramount to what's going to make the ecosystem survive. Um, not to comment on the other, the other blockchain, but it's supposed, Cardano's gov uh, governance is supposed to be turned on at the end of this year and will be the only blockchain ecosystem to have it. Thank you for that. Um, we know that for something to move forward and not become irrelevant over time, it definitely needs a way to move forward. And with most centralized companies, the way that this happens is that the person in charge pushes this forward, but this cannot happen in a decentralized blockchain. And that's why Cardano pushes forward with its decentralized governance. Adrian, over to you to add your two cents to Cardano's governance. Yeah, sure, thank you. And just wanna comment a little bit more what do we mean by governance in crypto? We mean uh, the ability for token holders to vote and decide on, on the decision making on the roadmap, on the path in the future. So, for example, Cardano governance means the ADA holders uh, deciding on what the, ADA block, the Cardano blockchain will do in the future. Uh, the min holders, the token holders of the MinSwap protocol can do the same and decide how MinSwap advances, what type of plans we do or so on. Um, yeah, and about Cardano, so Cardano prioritized the governance uh, ahead of the scaling. And what that was is Cardano follows a first principle approach. So decentralization over everything. And that means we don't want a team like other blockchains perhaps that is deciding how the chain is scaling and kind of doing the roadmap themselves. Uh, we want the ADA holders that decide how the blockchain chain, uh, scales, yeah? So, so that when governance is enabled, there will be lots of teams trying to buy for, for the different roadmap plans and for the funding for them because the, the tertiary, as you mentioned, will be opened up. So different teams, they'll be putting different proposals, how they want to scale Cardano, and the ADA holders are the ones who decide. So that's the whole principle behind like prioritizing governance. I have something quickly to add, which is on the Cardano governance. You can actually, you can actually divide your vote, right? It's not one wallet, one vote. You have a certain number of set of tokens which you can vote, but then you can choose to have parts of your portfolio uh, vote for something else, or you could even delegate that vote to someone else. So you could say, you know, I really like Roshan, I like the way he thinks, so 10% of my vote is going to go how he votes, uh, without him touching, really having any control over my vote. So you can just delegate these things, and you can that way create what we call liquid democracy. It'll be great to see um, how you can delegate your votes to different people. One criticism of the current US system is that you have to elect someone that then decides what they're going to do during their campaign. 
But in a system like Cardano, you will elect someone who will implement the vision of the people. So the people and the Cardano holders will still submit their proposals, and the person who is voted to the top will simply execute on those proposals and be measured against how well they're executing on the people's vision. Kinsit, what will Cardano governance look like in the next three to five years? Uh, so for the governance side, um, just like what we see, um, Intercept is now here. So Intercept is an organization which helps to bring up the reps here, representative to do the governance uh, for the future treasury open of the Cardano ecosystem. And then the, to the okay. um, And then the second part would be like, uh, uh, just like what you, we all mentioned, the project actors, there will be more and more actors getting involved. And you can see like uh, the community is now moving into the governance side to, to decide how to use the funds, what project or what proposal to be, to be, to be elected. Um, so just like for us, as an example, Sidan Lab, we propose together with Bobo Capital to host the Hong Kong Cardano Committee event, and we will also host the Cardano Developer Series event uh, later on uh, during the summer. Um, so you can see these kind of activities, we are also getting funded. Um, a lot of people to vote for this idea, and you can see for the three to five years coming onwards, it will continue to grow. And I, that's why we are seeking for more people to join because um, in Sidan Lab, what we are trying to say is we want to uh, bring impactful blockchain use cases um, into the real world life. So that's why we are actively looking for collaborators to do some, to bring in some real use case to our real life. Yeah, so I think that's the way it goes. I can add quickly governance. Governance will be handled with three pillars. One, uh, it's a bit like the US governance. One is going to be the Constitutional Committee, which is uh, going to take care of making sure that every proposal is in line with the, with the rest of the, the founding documents of the, of the ecosystem, which will be drafted this year, by the way. And then you have the DREPs, which kind of acts like a Congress. You know, it's the people, the, your representatives that you vote for. And finally, you'll have the validators, the, um, the stakeholder operators. So these three, those three groups of people will be in charge of the governance. So I turn my attention now to Cardano's reputation. Despite the structure, the transparency, and the $1.5 billion war chest to fund all future activity, why is Cardano still ignored by the VCs, Yuri? Uh, I think we mentioned already the sort of the, the gap in knowledge, that's for one. But I think the second, the second aspect of it is that Cardano's ethos of building things slow and testing them for a long time, making sure it works before deploying it, doesn't really go well with VC with the VC mindset. You know, VCs are here to make money for their for their clients. There's nothing wrong with that. But generally, the, the the crypto cycles are just going so fast, and there's usually not a lot of attention span for people who build, bo you know, somewhat boring things, but things that are actually meant to last for a long time. But it, in the last couple of months, I've seen things change actually. So that that that's actually slowly changing. People are starting to wonder. Well, what's going on in this ecosystem? So I've seen some VCs, VCs move on that. You opened up saying that there might be a knowledge gap. Uh, for Adrian, as someone who's working in MinSwap, how do we bridge the knowledge gap within and beyond the crypto space so that people are aware of the progress that's being made in the ecosystem? Yeah, I think, uh, by the way, it's working? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think there is three parts to the uh, knowledge gap. First of all, within Cardano, um, I think many people are hesitant to use the DeFi protocols like MinSwap. Uh, many people don't have much experience, especially actually most of the big ADA holders, they are in Japan. Uh, so perhaps we need to do some more education of DeFi in Japanese and try to attract those holders, uh, have some better opportunities for them as well. Then there's a knowledge gap also within the wider crypto sphere around Cardano. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of a stigma. As a builder, actually, whenever I go on Twitter, every day almost I see people commenting negative, negative things about Cardano or what I mentioned, like what they mentioned that VCs do not invest in Cardano and so on. Um, that is really tough to address this narrative, uh, but we've been doing it for so long already. Like 
as I mentioned, in 2021, people were saying Cardano will never have smart contracts, and here we are now. So I think the only way really to bridge that is through, through instead of like words, through actions and through providing better opportunities, through growing our ecosystem and yeah, providing better investment opportunities to better yield. I think we, we are working towards that, uh, but I think that's the only way to address the, the crypto knowledge gap. And then when it comes to people from outside, yeah, Cardano definitely needs to grow more adoption with people that are not familiar with crypto. I think the best way is to do what we're doing now, maybe, and do real-world events where we can get the chance to talk to people about Cardano, about the advantages, what makes it unique, how you can use it, and so on. Thank you for that. It's nice to see what that effort can look like on three different scales within the Cardano ecosystem, to the broader industry, and then to people that we see every day. Um, and yes, events like this are a great way to do it, and also follow-up conversations. I, I feel like one-on-one, -on -one, it's usually easier to understand some of the concepts and ask follow-up questions. And so, with all of this um, bridging of the knowledge, and we, when we eventually have people coming into Cardano, uh, as they begin to understand it, the chain will need to be able to handle the increase in users. And that puts us into our last topic before the Q&A. Scalability. So Kinsen, Yuri, and Adrian, what brings the next 100 million users to Cardano, and how will Cardano handle them? Starting with Kinsen. All right, sure. Uh, so I think, uh, to be honest, I think the governance and also the, the scalability thing will be parallel way. Um, I think in order to onboard more users to, to come to Cardano, we need to let the people know what are the opportunities right now in Cardano? What are the, for example, the DeFi ecosystem looks like, what it lacks. So you need to know what is the problem right now. So for, uh, at least an example, for example, just like I mentioned, uh, uh, we have a proposal approved uh, from the Catalyst uh, studying the deep, uh, high frequency trading possibility. And uh, we actually do a lot of data simulation and visualization to see the feasibility of high frequency trading approach in the Cardano ecosystem. And uh, on our Twitter page, we'll definitely disclose more information on going on our works. Uh, but in short, it's like, a, in short, the answer is yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, and then we, and that's why like we then need to find a way to tell the institutional players um, to let them know about this opportunity because no one knows it. So I think this is one of the uh, major key steps to show you um, the scaling solution together with the, um, the governance together and let people know about the opportunity here. Very welcome. Yeah, as, as Adrian mentioned, I mean, there's a bit of a stigma, so you know, how do we overcome it and bring the next people? It's like, we have to do what we're currently doing. Every community member, of course, in the Corona ecosystem has sort of like a mission, you know, and that's how we get together and, and, and we do these events. Everyone is in their own domain, but we, we are fun, you know, Mitswap is a DEX and, and these guys, Sitan Labs, you know, they're, they're building their own solutions there. So everyone keep doing what they're doing and, you know, they, 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 crypto Twitter is really unkind in that every time they say this is not going to happen and once it happens, they just push, they just move the goalposts, right? But Cardano just keeps on building and for as long as we don't have hacks uh, and infrastructure failures and uh, as long as we're decentralized, I think over time, the critics will be slowly and slowly silenced. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe people will always hate Cardano, I have no idea, but um, but actually, just the only way is to keep delivering good products that work. And I do mean that work, not those that crush, right? No references here. Yeah, so um, on the topic of scaling, I mean, it's not my main area of expertise. I'm more of a tokenomics DeFi guy. Um, I think we do depend a little bit more on the macro adoption of blockchain as a whole, and I think Cardano is really well positioned once blockchain technology gets more adoption to be one of the main ones uh, for the reasons we mentioned, decentralized, the liquid staking, and so on. Um, but I did wanna, yeah, I listened to a podcast recently and I did wanna make a point about like why Cardano is different or the mission of Cardano, a little bit of the underlying principles. So, when you are trying to design a blockchain, I think it mainly comes down to 
Uh, do you want people to be able to run the blockchain on a thing like a Raspberry Pi? That's a very simple kind of hardware that anybody at home can have. Or do you want it to be run on huge servers that, that have to require a lot of capital expenditure? Um, I think some blockchains to get very efficient and fast transactions, they go through the, through the big service way. Maybe some blockchain like Solana. And that's totally fine, that's totally legitimate and it has a use case. They're building a financial system more efficient than, than the current one, quicker because they're using these big servers. Uh, and that's totally legitimate. But Cardano is building something very different. Cardano is building something that you can validate at home, you can use these Raspberry Pis. That means it's incredibly censorship resistant. So imagine if there's a big failure in one of these servers, which we have seen happen in other chains, the chain will just shut off for, for some time, maybe a few hours. And yeah, that, that maybe works, I mean, for some use cases, but if you want something that is completely censorship resistant, uh, that will not really work. So that is what Cardano is building. It's not just a financial system that is quicker, thanks to blockchain, it's a, yeah, kind of different, more censorship resistant system where you can have identity solutions, you can have something like uh, real world assets and logistics implement because of the way it's built. So yeah, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, and as you mentioned, there's space for the both to coexist. If you're building a quicker financial system that you need a few people to control, then maybe institutional servers make more sense. If you were trying to build something else with decentralized governments and identity, then maybe having something that's Raspberry Pi makes more sense. But with that, uh, the organized talk comes to an end, and we'd like to open up the floor to Q&A. But first, could we have a round of applause for the people? Thank you, and uh, open to questions now. Um, yeah, thanks guys for such an insightful and great discussion. Um, just a quick question, uh, especially for Yuri. Um, you mentioned that like VCs are looking for like large token allocation and you know quickly sell when it gets hyped. Like, curious to know like what does Waffle Capital do different here? So, thank you for your question. Good question. What we do is completely different than VCing. What we do is we, you see, VCing is they come in early before there's even a product, right? There's an idea and they support the team and then they get their allocation. We actually come in after because we, we realized that Cardano needed some liquidity. Right? There's a bit of liquidity. So some, it's, like, it's like saying there's a beautiful highway but there's no cars, right? So we're, we're gonna get into the car business. So what we do is we, we use platforms such as Mistra actually and we provide liquidity. We use the lending and borrowing platforms. We use actually all sorts of platforms. I can't give you a full detailed picture right here. But we basically become the first larger users of those products. And, uh, and we're there basically to, to, to push the growth. So after it's been launched, actually. Since we've come out of the, of the woods and people have started to notice us, we've had a mountain of deals coming our way as if we were VCs. So we've been scratching our heads saying, well, maybe we should also do this. But okay, that always requires more funds. But it's definitely worth actually considering. But for now, even when we were considering it, we noticed that it didn't really, some, some of the deals don't align in terms of timeline with, with what our fund is trying to do. And this has, sometimes has to do with just timing, that's all. But uh, we're definitely considering it. But we do, we do liquidity providing. Great, thank you. That answer your question? Yeah, yeah. thanks. So I have a question, kind of all, for all three. Uh, you mentioned that Cardano is proof of stake, so I'm curious, does that lead to centralization like Lido or centralized exchange on Ether? And if so, does that pose the same risk as well? Okay, great question. Do you mind if I answer that? I don't want to do. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, I'll just make a quick comparison, really, because it's a really good point you raised. It's a question of centralization with proof of stake. There's a few things to consider here. One is, on, like, we'll take Ethereum as the benchmark. To become a validator and to be able to stake natively, you need 32 ETH. Uh, that's a lot of money, so you have a high barrier of entry. Second, on Ethereum, there's a concept called slashing, which means if, as a validator, you don't perform your duty as a validator properly, the blockchain actually penalizes you. Right? That exists on Ethereum proof of stake right now. And, uh, and so, so these two factors actually incentivize people to, well, 
to go towards the small professional grade corporate validators. So Lido, everyone has heard of Lido and Ethereum, they're the number one you know, uh, staking service. They control about, if my memory is semi right, about 20, 26 to 29 percent of the whole of all the validation. Coinbase is another 16 percent. So basically, if, 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 P, if there's a high barrier to entry and there's slashing, slashing which is punishment, people are not going to take the risk. There's no slashing on Cardano. The final thing I'll say is that you need a good token distribution. You need the, the underlying token to be properly propagated all around so that you don't have a few whales controlling the whole system. Now Cardano's got all of these things, so it's got a really low barrier of entry for the, the stake pool operators, the validators. You do need to get the delegation, though that's the hard work. Um, but becoming a node is not an issue, and there is no slashing also. So the, the worst that can happen to you on Cardano and the staking thing is that you don't get the rewards because the, the stake pool operator, the validator, didn't do his job properly. Um, but other than that, anyone can become one, which, which makes it incredibly decentralized. That being said, there are the largest pool of validators on Cardano, I think they control six to six and a half percent of the chain, which is really not that much. That's the largest. So and anyone else after that is smaller. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <coughs> so other than um, transactions per second, and as you mentioned earlier, in Cardano, let's say you want to set 100 NFTs, 100 different wallets, you can do that with one transaction. So my question is, other than those factors, what other factors should one consider when looking at the scalability of the Cardano? So um, I think the transaction, the, the transaction that you just mentioned is a really good metric for you to learn about the scalability issue. And also, for example, the FMC trading, like the limitation of the Cardano blockchain right now, um, it takes twenty it, it takes twenty seconds for you to verify a transaction. It will be very hard. But for for example, uh, from our research, we already proved that it, it can save all the time to execute that transaction. So this kind of scalability research uh, will help to facilitate and prove that the Cardano blockchain we could um, we could overcome the limitations uh, yeah, a lot for a lot. Um, so I think what is the most important point is to let the builders and also the users to get involved, to study about like find a way to get involved in the project development side. And that's why we could then work together and get through the limitations right now. If I could um, add my two cents to that. We've seen on a lot of other popular chains that a lot of the settlement that was traditionally on the layer one is actually shipped out to a layer two and then confirmed with the layer one. And so in pursuit of this, Cardano's founding entities have actually started creating a partner chain framework, which they've taken the infrastructure from Polkadot which has been heavily researched, and they're now implementing that into Cardano, such that the main Cardano chain will be a global settlement, where all of your other chains can plug in and settle their transactions there. And so beyond transactions within transactions and other metrics that you can do on the Cardano chain, there's also a lot of outsourcing for certain transactions that wouldn't need instant finality. And so, Putting all of those together, you get a robust system with the research that goes on to push the baton further and further each year. And I think with that, we're coming to a close. So thank you all for coming, and thank you Yuri, Kinson, and Adrian for your time and valuable insights. <laughs>